Thank you, Nikhil. So what I want to do in this talk is uh, I want to get you familiar with a uh, maybe also not so well-known model for scheduling under uncertainty, and that is scheduling with stochastic processing times. So the talk is going to be a very mild introductory or mini introductory lecture uh, into this model of stochastic uh, machine scheduling. And I try to do that along with some of the recent results that we obtained for that model. And that is results that I got together with Martin Scutella and Maxim Sviridenko on the most general of all these machine scheduling models, and that is unrelated machine scheduling, which already has been talked about quite a lot this morning. Okay. So if you are unsure what is stochastic scheduling and uh, what is exactly all of that, don't worry, everything will be defined. Okay. So let me start by setting the scene, looking from the deterministic perspective and what is known about these problems. And I really start with the simplest problem that you, that you can imagine, also to fix a little bit of the notation. So we have n jobs, and these jobs have weights, w, and processing times p. Let's assume they are integer. And in my talk, these jobs are non-preemptive. So once started, they must not be interrupted. Okay. So if you want to sequence these jobs on a single machine, each job receives a completion time, which will be denoted CJ. And it's a very well-known result, which actually doesn't even deserve the name to be a result. But it's known as Smith's rule. The best thing to do is you sequence the jobs in the order weight over processing time. So largest weight over processing time first. So largest relative importance of the job goes first. And that's a simple exchange argument. So that problem is not interesting. Now suppose we want to schedule the same jobs, but now we have a set of identical and parallel machines. Okay. Still, we want to minimize the same objective function. I forgot to mention that. We want to minimize the total weighted sum of the completion times, okay? or the total sum of the completion times. Weight could, weights could also be one. On a set of identical machines, the problem gets a little bit more interesting, but also that case is completely settled, essentially. So uh, it is one of the problems that was listed strongly and hard in the book by Gary and Johnson. If you do Smith's rule, so that means whenever a machine falls idle, you pick the job with remaining highest ratio weight over processing time, and you do that one. That's known to be a 1.2 approximation, and that is tight by this paper by Kapagichi and Kuan. And since about 15 years, we know that there exists a PTAS. So also this case is essentially closed. Right? Now move on one further. Now assume these machines are no longer identical. So the processing times of the jobs can depend on the machine on which it is processed. Uh, so once again, that means, for instance, it could mean that this uh, red job over here uh, is quicker on the first machine, but longer on the second machine, and that could be completely reverse for some other jobs, right? So there is no dependence whatsoever. That problem also gets more challenging. It's, uh, there does not exist an approximation scheme, so it's APX hard, that is known. And uh, until about a year ago, a three-halves approximation was the best known, which was described in several of the papers in uh, scheduling theory. But since about a year, we know that you can get below this three halves uh, by a very remarkable result by Nikhil, Ola, and Aravind. Okay. Now, this talk is going to be about stochastic scheduling. So that means the processing times of the jobs will become stochastic variables, random variables. So let me, at this point in time, already mention what the results is going, result is going to be. So we show that for stochastic unrelated machine scheduling, you can get a 3 plus delta over 2 approximation. Okay? So that's a 3 halves approximation if that delta wouldn't be there. Um, and that delta will be defined a little bit later, but you should think of it as a measure for the variability of a job. It is an upper bound on the squared coefficient of variation of the job. So the higher the variability, the worse our approximation guarantee is getting here. Okay. So that's the result, but I first of all have to define what is stochastic scheduling. Okay. Now let me do that. So the main difference to all the other models is now that when we see a job, it's something in between clairvoyant and non-clairvoyant. So um, when we see a job, we get a distribution for its processing time. Okay. 
So the best way to think of it uh, for this talk is in terms of, say, survival probabilities. Look at this green job over here. So it's maybe started at time zero, and that is corresponding to a discrete distribution here, which has a processing time of one with probability one half. And if not one, then it will be three or four, each with probability one over four. Okay. So uh, that would be, and then this staircase function describes the survival probability for this job over time, right, if it started at time zero. So this would be a discrete distribution, but in general, it can also be a continuous or whatever distribution. I don't care. Okay. So that's the input that you get, and that is also what you get to see. Uh, so you see, you get these input distributions. Now, what is the solution to such a problem? The solution is, of course, no longer a schedule, because I, cannot I can no longer assign a fixed starting time to a job. Uh, that depends on what has happened before, and that is all random variables. So the solution is going to be what is known as a non-anticipatory scheduling policy. And one way to think of it, suppose everything is discrete, that makes it easier to think about it. One way to think of that is it's just a huge decision tree which for each state that you might come across decides how to go next. So this job has ended first, okay, so I then continue that way and so on and so on. So it's, a, it's such a, just a huge decision tree. And non-anticipatory refers to the fact that at any point in time, I am, of course, allowed to use all the information that I have accumulated over the past, but I'm not allowed to look into the future. So if you look at this figure here, that's the same green job from above here, you realize that at this point in time, it has not been a processing time of one, so it must be three or four. So this extra information you can use in future decisions, but you're not allowed to look into the future of those not, un not yet finished jobs. Yes, there's okay, a question. Can you interrupt the job? In your mind? No, it's all non-preemptive. So once you have started a job, you can not preempt it anymore. You have to finish it uh, until the end. Any other questions at this point? Yes. Distribution between different machines are completely different. Could be completely different. Yes. Yeah. Right. So here, these, uh, this large PJ will now denote the random variable for a job if it does not depend on the machine, or it will be PIJ if it does depend on the machine, and that can be arbitrary, like in the unrelated machine scheduling model. Any other questions at this point? Yes. So for a particular job, its size and different machines are independent? Yes. Okay. Could be, yeah, could be arbitrary. Or what do you? There are no correlations. Across. No. No, no. All right. OK, so one thing that you have to think about, how do you define optimality for this uh, setting? Because suppose you have an instance and you have a scheduling policy, you have chosen one, then the outcome, so the cost of the schedule, is going to be a random variable. So how do we compare two different scheduling policies? Um, and what I do here is the simplest thing. We just compare their expectations. So we call a policy optimal if it achieves the minimum expected performance among all non-anticipatory non policies, all right? And you might ask, I mean, I wrote an infimum here because, I mean, this uh, could be an uncountable set, right? Uh, does an optimal policy actually always exist? And there is a quite general result that shows that under very mild circumstances, yes, an optimum policy actually exists, which also attains this infimum here. Okay, so in particular, that's true for the setting I'm considering here. All right. So that is the notion of optimality. And let me go through a little example here. Um, so here, we're, there's a question. Yes. Yeah, so about the previous slide. Yes. So you said the existence follows from that result. Does that mean that these guys have considered a stochastic scheduling or they have? They have considered stochastic scheduling, exactly. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. OK. Back to this example, um, we have four jobs. We have two deterministic jobs, that is blue jobs. They have a processing time of one. And we have two stochastic <coughs> jobs, that's these green jobs over here. And they can either, they disappear with large probability four over five, or they turn out to be very long. I mean, this is going to be the constructions for all the bad examples, of course. Um, with probability one over five, and notice that the expected processing time of these green jobs will be two, okay? Now, let me ask you, suppose you want to schedule these four jobs on two machines. Which goes first, blue or green? Any 
intuitions? According to expectation, blue, but probably the green. <laughs> Very good answer. I mean, green, doing green first is a kind of gamble, right? I mean, you hope that they turn out to be short, and then you are in good shape. Uh, the answer is both is wrong. It's, uh, it's even more complicated. So um, my, cr my claim here is that there is a kind of delicate trade-off going on between balancing, say, you want to delay the jobs which have a large processing times because they will, be, they will be blocking your machine expectation, but you want to also delay jobs which have a high probability of getting very long, so that's the heavy tail jobs. And for this simple instance, the only optimum policy is really to start a green and a blue job and then you have to continue with green, and then you do the last blue job. Okay? It has a certain expected completion time here. I forgot to mention that in this example, all the weights are one. So it's just total expected completion time of the jobs. Okay? Uh, proof, just work it out. I mean, it's a simple case distinction, right? I mean, anything else is worse than that. And because it's so nice, I have this picture here. So I start a green and a blue job. Then with high probability, I can immediately start the second green job here, right? Um, with small probability, the second green job has to wait for the blue job. And then the final job arrives, this uh, second deterministic job. With reasonably high probability, it can even go on the first machine. Or it has to wait for the blue job if the first green job turned out to be long. Or it even has to wait for the second green job on the second machine. Or it will go at the very end only when the long green job has finished, right, with small probability. So that's how such a schedule is going to look like. Okay? And one important thing already now, I will come back to that, it seems like in this schedule there is a lot of air, which looks kind of suboptimal, but uh, I mean this is how a schedule looks like. Okay? All right, so you can even drive this example or such examples a little bit further, and I just mentioned that very briefly, you can show or you can construct instances, if you also introduce weights, where any optimal policy has to deliberately leave a machine idle. Okay? So very briefly only, so we have this red job, which is super important, and it's either blocking the machine forever, we have two machines here, or it just vanishes after a very small amount of time epsilon, right? Because it's so expensive, you must do it first, and that means if you wait until the time epsilon, then you know if you will have one or two machines available for the remaining jobs. I didn't specify these jobs here, but they are all stochastic here. And it could be that if you have one machine available, that you want to do the blue jobs first. And if you have two machines available, you want to do the green jobs, for, green jobs first. I mean, you can construct such examples rather easily. And then the in, really only optimal thing is to leave this machine idle for a so small amount of time to gain information in which situation am I actually in. Okay? So the bottom line of all this discussion and the example is optimum policies. Yeah, there is a question. I have no clue, but the gap in this example is negligible. It's very small, but it's, uh, it's a constant, yeah. <laughs> yes? You can only do this in weighted cases, right? That's right. Uh, this is with weights. Without weights, still I don't know. It's, uh, I, as far as I know, it's open. With arbitrary distributions, okay? Anyhow, so the bottom, bottom line of this example and also the previous one is that, you know, it, it at least looks like intuitively optimum policies that can be huge exponential size, maybe decision trees. They are, it's definitely NP hard or APX hard, depending on if we work on identical or unrelated machines, uh, because already the deterministic case is hard and um, that's contained as a special case. Um, and also there is results showing that if you give me a policy, uh, computing the expected value of that policy may be a number p hard problem. Okay. Um, I mean a better hardness result would be a nice thing. I will come back to that in the conclusions. So that at least, you know, it seems reasonable to be okay with approximation algorithms and the definition of an approximation algorithm for me is going to be we have that the expected cost of our policy, pi, is not more than alpha times the expected cost of an optimal scheduling policy. And here is an important difference. I'm not comparing to the offline optimum here. I'm comparing to the 
best non-anticipatory policy, which of course I don't know. Okay? So the adversary here is definitely weaker than the offline optimum. There are different models which have been considered by Angelika Steger and others, but uh, our adversary is non-anticipatory too. Uh, so we compare with the best thing that you can do given that the future is uncertain. Uh, that's what we do here. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about uh, approximation algorithms for um, uh, these kind of scheduling problems. So we have been able to show in this paper uh, quite some time ago um, to, that there exist constant factor approximation algorithms as long as you have an upper bound on the coefficient of variation of these random variables. Okay? So the bound is, three again, 3 plus delta divided by 2. Uh, so for instance, if you assume exponentially distributed processing times, the coefficient of variation is exactly 1, so that would be a 2 approximation. Okay? Uh, the special case deterministic processing times is three halves and so on. So that's a result that holds true for Smith's rule on identical and parallel machines. Okay. Um, there have been several extensions, for instance, to problems with precedence constraints or to the setting where these stochastic jobs actually arrive online. This is not the case for the model that I explained so far. So far, everything is just given from the outset but they also might arrive online, and you can also do something there. So the bottom line of this, yes? We consider completion time and not flow time, yeah? Even That's exactly right. That is ex total expected completion time or total expected weighted completion time, yes. Uh, it can include weights. Yeah. It's just linear, so that doesn't really matter. All these results are, however, for identical machines and not for unrelated machines. Um, and they use, except for this one, paper, uh, this one paper here, they all use, either in the algorithmic construction or in the lower bound, a linear programming lower bound that we came up with in this paper here. And let me just briefly show you what that is. So the core ingredient of this LP is what is sometimes called load inequalities for scheduling problems. And uh, I don't want to, to really pass this. It's uh, the only thing that is maybe interesting to see is that we have on the left hand side here something where that involves the expected completion times of jobs under a certain policy right and on the right hand side we have some function which turns out to be supermodular so that we can actually optimize over this polyhedron efficiently and uh, that's an inequality for each possible subsets of the jobs and the interesting thing here is that you see this red term here which includes the variance of the jobs with a negative sign. So that means the higher the variance of the random variables that we put in, the weaker these inequalities get. And this is exactly how we get this uh, coefficient of variation into the performance bounds. Okay? So these inequalities actually generalize LPs that have been used earlier in deterministic settings and uh, quite an amount of papers. All right. So. The point is, it, this cannot be generalized to the general unrelated machine setting, at least not in any meaningful, meaningful way, uh, and at least not that I'm aware of. So let us turn to unrelated machine scheduling, and now I talk about the recent results that we obtained, and then I conclude with yet another paper uh, that appeared last year. Okay, so first of all, so now really the, the setting is unrelated machines, arbitrary processing time distributions on different machines. So the first observation is that it's not too difficult to convince yourself that it essentially is no loss of generality if we assume discrete distributions, discrete integer value dis distributions. Okay? Uh, we just do that by shifting. I mean, suppose you have a continuous variable. You just shift all the probability through the next highest integer point, and then the rest is just standard scaling and blah, blah, blah. So that costs a 1 plus epsilon. So let's assume that is the case. Uh, that means we can define these variables here, x, i, j, t, which denote the probability for a given policy to start the job j on a machine i at a particular time t. So that's going to be a time index formulation for the problem. And uh, just, I mean, let's take this example that I had earlier already. So a job, of course, starts probabilistically at different points in time. So if we, again, think of this blue job, which is the last one to be scheduled, 
the corresponding variables would be like this, right? With a certain probability, the blue job was starting at time zero on the first machine, with a certain probability on time one on the second machine, and then here again with a small probability um, at time 10 on the first machine again. Uh, so that would be the corresponding variables that correspond to the policy that I showed earlier. Uh, that was just greedily scheduling the jobs in this order. All right, is that clear? Now let's, using these variables, let's set up an LP. And the most important thing about this slide is coming now. So how do I express the expected completion time of a job in these variables? Okay, it's important to remember that policies are non-anticipatory. So at the moment that I start a job, what will be the processing time for this job in expectation? It will just be the expected processing time of that job because the decision to schedule a job must be independent of the actual processing time of the job. And therefore, I can just express the expected completion time like this, right? If I decide to, to start a job at time t, that's independent of the actual processing time. So the completion time will just be the starting time t plus its, its expected processing time on that particular machine. So here we really need that policies are not allowed to look into the future. And the rest is just kind of standard. So each job should, of course, be scheduled on any one of the uh, machines. And now in order to model the constraint that any machine can only do one job at a time, we uh, write down the probability for a job to be in process at a particular time. So let's say at this time three here. To be in process at that time, the job should have been started earlier and it must still be alive, right? And this is just what I write down here. It has been started at some time here and it should still be alive at that time that I look at. And I just add up over all these uh, times from zero to time s that I'm considering. Okay, so that's the probability for one job. Now if I sum that up over all the jobs, right, I know that that cannot be more than one because each machine can only do one job at a time. And that's already the whole LP, that's it. I mean, that's, uh, it's not very difficult. Okay, so that's the LP. And uh, well, a solution might look like this. And I show this picture here to make clear that this LP does not model the stochastic scheduling problem. It's really only a relaxation because in this LP, we are, we are kind of solving this Tetris game where everything will be as much shifted to, be the, to the beginning as possible, but that's not necessarily a scheduling, scheduling policy. The next slide makes, makes that even clearer. Suppose I have just two jobs, one after each other on one machine, and they have exponentially distributed processing times. So for any time t, there is positive probability that the second job will start at that time t, right? So do we have to deal with this infinite size LP here? Uh, so that might be a technical problem. So the solution, the actual solution of the uh, situation where I just schedule the jobs one after the other will look like this. But the answer is no, exactly because the LP can do more things, right? The LP can just, for instance, accumulate uh, the, the big bulk of all these probabilities together and put it as early as can. So that would be a feasible solution of the linear program, but it would again not correspond to a solution of the scheduling problem, right? So with this an insight, it's not too difficult to show that uh, the LP always has a finite optimal solution and we can actually, by, by usual tricks and scheduling, show that we can solve it efficiently up to arbitrary precision. Uh, so there is an F Peters to solve this LP. All right, so I'm about to come to the final algorithm. So the algorithm, again, is also very simple. We just solve this LP, say optimally or approximately optimally, and now we just assign jobs to machines right in the beginning according to the probabilities that have been proposed by the linear, linear programming solution, right? Now that we have probabilistically, uh, but everything can be de-randomized, assigned jobs to machines, we know a certain set of jobs on a single machine, and on a single machine we know what the optimum thing is to do. It's just using Smith's rule. Even though these processing times are stochastic, but on a single machine that doesn't matter. It's no difference. Okay? So that's the algorithm, and that gives a 3 plus delta over 2 approximation. So that's the result again. And let me give you one, two slides of the analysis. Um, we are not analyzing this algorithm actually. 
The difficulty with analyzing this thing is that the Smith's rule, of course, does not really connect to our LP solution. So that doesn't work. So what we are going to do is we just impose on each of the machines a different order which corresponds more or less exactly to the LP solution. And uh, this is how we do that. So it, it's probably worse what we are doing, but it can be analyzed. Okay? So we find an optimum LP solution down there. Then for each job, we decide according to the LP to which machine it should go and at which point in time. Right? So that's, uh, for instance, this red job here. Uh, then what we introduce is um, an additional delay for this job. Okay, this R here is going to be an additional delay that we put on this job, which, and the amount of the delay is probabilistic. It depends on the probability, the tail probability essentially of the job. So jobs which have a large tail have a larger probability of being delayed even further than the, than the LP suggested. Okay. And then we set the tentative start time of the job to be what the LP suggested, that is the T, plus this additional delay. All right, so um, let's do that. Here is an additional delay for this job, um, two time units for this red job. We do that for all the jobs. So these bullets now here denote the tentative start times of the jobs. And now we just sequence the jobs according to these tentative start times. So that, that's the right order that we want to consider here. Huh? So in each machine, we do the jobs not in the order of Smith's rule, which would be optimal, but in this different order. And in order to analyze that, I just state the key lemma. So if a job J has been assigned to machine I and has this tentative start time S, we can show that the total expected processing that happens before is exactly, at most, this S plus 1 half. Okay? This 1 half actually comes, comes from solving ties if two jobs receive the same tentative starting time. Okay. And doing that, I can immediately write down an upper bound for the expected completion time of a job, right? What is that? Well, it's the total expected processing that happened before. We have an upper bound for that. That is S plus 1 half plus its expected processing time. And that is, of course, conditioned on the fact that the job has been assigned there, right? And the rest is just calculus. I mean, there is nothing serious going on. Yes, there is a question. Uh, so do you do the speed rule for run machine based on the expectation? Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, if okay. you would do it based on the ratio weight over expected processing time, that's, a, that's how you define it. And that is optimal on one machine. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. There is even a paper where that was mentioned in the 60s. Yeah. OK, so that's the analysis. Now. <clears throat> If you think, uh, yeah, well, why, why didn't we, oh wait, I, I wanted to mention one thing, namely, where does this delta creep in again? This, this was an upper bound on the variability of the job. Um, it exactly creeps in because our tentative start time S that had this additional term, which de was dependent on the tail distribution of the job, and this term kind of screws up the performance bound. So this turns out to be exactly, if you work it out, uh, just an upper bound or exactly equal to the coefficient of variation here. Um, it's, it's quite funny that we obtain exactly the same bound, even though we use a completely different algorithm and also a completely different analysis. So when we first wrote the paper, we thought we had something better than that. Uh, which would have been great because we would have beaten the three halves as well. But I mean, of course, that was not true. Uh, so it, it's exactly the same bound that we obtained before using different algorithms. Now, if you think, how could this be improved? Uh, there is one obvious thing. So the algorithm that we use is stupid in the sense that right in the beginning, we assign jobs to machines and that's it. So we we do not gain anything from adapt adaptivity because we do not adapt, right? Everything has been assigned in the beginning. Um, so what we show is, yeah, any such policy that assigns right in the beginning can have an optimality gap, which essentially is delta over two. So it, it depends on the coefficient of variation, right? So if you want to get better than that, you might think, okay, so let's take the LP and let's try to define an adaptive policy that somehow depends on this LP solution. But also this doesn't work because we can also show simple examples, but uh, 
I don't have time to show them now, this time indexed LP also can have an optimality gap delta over two. So with this LP, you won't get anything better, right? Well, well, and one that is even on one machine. And the idea is essentially that the LP is allowed to slice drops in tiny parts and do all that in parallel. It's kind of, that is the idea. Uh, so Another question, do yeah. Do you use exponential distribution for the warbound? Sorry? The do you use exponential distribution? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, a, it's a nasty distribution again, yes. Yeah, that's a very good point because, I mean, once you assume something more about the distribution, maybe something better can be shown. I mean, that will be one of my, my questions at the end. Okay, I'm, I'm about to finish. So. Okay, so let me give some Final remarks, so obviously to improve it seems that adaptivity seems to be a good thing. So whenever some machine turns out to be empty, you may, you may want to revise your decision and do some jobs there. But if you think, let's just analyze Smith's rule, I mean, only adaptivity is not enough, right? So the Smith's rule, just <laughs> greedily scheduling the jobs, uh, jobs according to ratio weight over expected processing times also can be as bad as essentially well, uh, uh, the coefficient of variation of the underlying random variables, okay? Square root of that, but... Uh, so the, the open problems really are, can we find, say, a constant factor approximation which does not depend on the um, variability of the jobs, so independent of that, or maybe show that this is impossible, right? And anyhow, it's also open to really prove non-trivial for this particular model at least, non-trivial uh, hardness bounds. So I could imagine the problem is maybe p-space hard, but all the p-space hardness proofs kind of need more structure. So this problem has, a, has too little structure, or yeah, maybe, there, maybe that is possible. I mean, it would be very interesting to get something that goes beyond NP hardness uh, for, this, uh, for this problem. Um, in this first direction, uh, there was a very nice paper by uh, Sun Jing and Ben and Kirk, uh, Stacks, last year, where they showed, yes, you can find approximation algorithms which do not depend on this coefficient of variation, in their case at the expense of, well, an additional factor of m, for instance. Um, but the, the very cute thing here is to remark that the algorithm that they use in order to do so does exactly this balance between jobs with uh, high expected processing time and jobs with may turn out to be very long with a reasonably large probability. So that's exactly the algorithm that they are analyzing. And I guess I'm kind of out of time. Uh, but Ben and uh, Sun Jing are here and maybe can explain at some later point in time a little bit more about that. Uh, I had some slide here. I mean, what they, what they essentially show is that um, if you exclu exclude the right jobs, then the probability that our algorithm, which is excluding the right sets of jobs, blocks all machines beyond some deadline tau here, then that probability must be smaller than the probability that some optimal scheduling policy blocks all jobs beyond that deadline, which is slightly scaled by, by this factor alpha here, right? So that's the core insight that they, uh, and why, I mean, why is that true? Well, because the algorithm chooses exactly the right jobs, which, which uh, you know, have small expected processing time and do not have large tails, okay? Um, also a very nice result, I would say. So that's it, so let me conclude with just displaying some of the papers. Uh, We're a bit short on time, so we can take questions offline. And we meet at 2.20. Any chance of postponing that by like 15 minutes if we want to go and see Shafi's talk? OK, let's, get the uh, so, yeah, let's do it by 2.30 then. <laughs> Sometimes maybe you would leave a message on the phone. OK. Yeah. So, he's giving a talk at Soda on uh, pseudo-deterministic algorithm. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> It ends up 2.30, 1.30 to 2.30.